Welcome everyone to the 2DCC webinar series. Today we have Dr. Frank Pierce from Kenyon College. He is a 2DCC user and an expert in uh, spectroscopic electrometry. Please go ahead, Frank. Great, thanks so much, Kevin. So great to be with you guys and uh, hopefully I can sort of convince you uh, of the sort of the uh, advantages of ellipsometry and sort of uh, try to kind of set up the stage so that hopefully uh, some of the people who are growing samples uh, might be able to use this as a kind of a tool to uh, kind of uh, monitor growth and also to optimize structure. So that is my title uh, using uh, spectroscopic ellipsometry and mainly in situ ellipsometry uh, to uh, monitor growth and also to optimize structures. So I'm Frank Pierce, and then I teach at Kenyon College in the mm -hmm. physics department. Uh, and um, let's kind of go ahead and uh, show me, show you my, the, the, the students who are working with me. So uh, Kenyon College is an undergraduate institute. So only no graduate students, all undergraduates. Uh, so the samples that are provided by 2DCC. Uh, and uh, sort of five students have gone on to, uh, you know, we have already graduated. Uh, and then uh, there's Liz Hauser, who's also, who's working with me currently. Uh, and then of course, you know, the students who have graduated have really benefited uh, from working with these samples from the 2DCC. And most of them have actually pursued uh, condensed matter physics or pursuing condensed matter physics in graduate school. Uh, I have worked with quite a few folks at 2DCC, but uh, what I'm going to talk about today, uh, the samples were grown by Maria uh, Hills uh, and of course, Roman when he was at uh, Penn State. Uh, so, you know, uh, a lot of credit has to go to Maria uh, because if not for the samples, I won't be talking to you today. Uh, all right, so let's sort of uh, go over the outline. I want to kind of uh, set the stage and kind of uh, give everybody uh, sort of an inter quick introduction to the dielectric function and also say something about the physics of ellipsometry. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with it, but let's sort of make sure that we uh, understand the, the, the sort of the, the important physics of this problem and then say something a little bit about the topological insulators because these are the samples that I'm going to use. Uh, and then uh, I'll talk about two studies that uh, basically uh, one study is about single films of bismuth selenide. And then we also have heterostructures. That's, uh, that's a kind of an interesting problem. So uh, how, uh, how we are going to use in situ ellipsometry to sort of study these single films as well as heterostructures. Uh, that's going to be the uh, my talk. All right, so let's just quickly go over the sort of the main, uh, the thrust of the, the concept of the dielectric function. So remember, this is not the static dielectric function. This is the dielectric function that is a function of uh, energy or frequency. And it's a complex number. It's a real part and an imaginary part. Uh, the interesting thing is that uh, all of sort of the behavior or the sociology of electrons, phonons, whether it be free electrons or band electrons, they are sort of stamped on the dielectric, uh, the dielectric function. So if you kind of measure the dielectric function, then you sort of can get an idea or get some insights as to the behavior of electrons, phonons, uh, et cetera. So the main constituents of the material that you're sort of exploring. Uh, so the uh, uh, you can sort of think there are, of course, because there's a real part and an imaginary part. Let's look at the imaginary part, one that is in green. And you can see that these are kind of, there are peaks in the dielectric function, the imaginary part. And what you find is that these kind of uh, peaks correspond to sort of transitions in your medium, in your material. So this can be sort of free electrons, maybe phonons and band electrons. So all of the kind of the behavior of your, uh, uh, of these electrons and phonons are sort of stamped. So then if you can basically measure this, uh, the dielectric function and then uh, sort of reevaluate it or sort of by further analysis of the dielectric function, you can get insights into the dispersion of the phonons or the dispersion of the, the electrons. So this is kind of the crucial thing about 
the dielectric function. And of course, uh, so now the question is, how do you sort of measure this? And at Kenyon, uh, we do a lot of uh, sort of measuring the dielectric function. Uh, and one of the coolest ways to measure the dielectric function without getting into these problems is through ellipsometry. All right. So at Kenyon, uh, my group has two ellipsometers. Uh, 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 UV, this is ellipsometer. So the energy is uh, on the x-axis. So, you know, it's it spans about, I can do, uh, uh, I can measure the dielectric function uh, in three orders of magnitude, starting from about six milli electron volts to uh, about six electron volts. So uh, how do, uh, there's one ellipsometer, the UV ellipsometer that runs from this range and there's an infrared ellipsometer. Uh, and then of course uh, that cuts off about 60 milli electron volts. I can go further. I don't have another ellipsometer here, but I can use uh, 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 FTIR, uh, Fourier transform infrared uh, spectros spectrometer. Uh, and then basically you can measure the reflectivity of the same sample that you have done ellipsometry and through the reflectivity spectra, you can sort of uh, measure or obtain the dielectric function. So really kind of then, you know, uh, from your um, general physics, the phonons sort of reside here. In fact, the free electrons reside here and the phonons around here. Uh, and then of course, rest of it is the electrons. So really once again, uh, by sort of getting the, getting hold of the dielectric function, who are actually sort of trying to get, get a hold of uh, uh, how these uh, phonons and electrons behave in your, uh, in your material, all right. Uh, now, well, one other thing is that, of course, now we're going to talk about infrared, sorry, uh, in situ ellipsometer, uh, ellipsometry rather. So uh, that's sort of coupled to the, the, the growth chambers. And uh, so those, are, those ellipsometers reside in this range, uh, uh, not, infrared. Uh, I don't think I have seen any kind of uh, literature infrared ellipsometer into a, a NB or a, a MOCVD chamber. In fact, Maria and I were talking about this. Hopefully we might be able to, you know, do this some other time. Okay, so uh, besides, uh, I just wanted to also kind of say something about my relationship with the 2DCC. Uh, I've been working with uh, you folks since 2018 and uh, I've worked, worked with Anthony and uh, Nitin on several kind of samples, uh, bismuth uh, antimonide toluride and zirconium toluride. And then of course, I'm going to talk about bismuth selenide stuff that I've worked with uh, Maria and Roman. And then also I'm currently working with some uh, PMDs with uh, that uh, uh, John and basically uh, Tom McGrain. So I've uh, done a lot of ellipsometry uh, with, uh, with the samples that are basically uh, coming out from the 2DCC. Okay, so let's quickly kind of sketch the physics of the, um, the problem. So uh, what are we trying to do here? So uh, let's assume that you have a sample like this, which has a kind of a, a complex index of refraction. So let's just kind of identify these things. The complex index of refraction is this index of refraction that you're used to. Uh, and then of course there's a complex part as well. So, you know, for glass 1.5, we say the index of refraction is 1.5 and that's because the K, the extinction coefficient is zero, right? That's why otherwise we have to put two, give two parameters to define this complex index of refraction. And if I take the square of that, that's equal to the dielectric function, right? So keep that in mind, uh, these are all complex numbers. Uh, and uh, then, of course, I can also relate the absorption coefficient, uh, which is kind of proportional to the uh, extinction coefficient. All right. So here's a material that has a complex index of refraction or a dielectric function. And I have also uh, light that, that there's another medium, let's say air, which has another index of refraction. So you send polarized light, so linearly polarized light. And then basically uh, it sort of reflects, and of course some of it is transmitted. Uh, this process basically changes the polarization. So which means that if it was 45 degrees polarized, maybe when it's coming out here, it might be 35 degrees polarized. 
right? So basically, uh, the, the axis of the polarization. So, so, so in, in general, the linear polarized light actually changes to elliptically polarized light. That's why we call it ellipsometry, because if you can figure out the ellipticity of that light, then you can recover this complex index of refraction of this material. So that's the basic idea. So how do we basically cast this through Maxwell's equations? Of course, it's a boundary value problem. And of course, uh, Fresnel got into it before Maxwell. And these are called Fresnel reflection coefficients. And you can see this is for what we call the P polarized light. So P is basically parallel to the plane of incidence. S is the perpendicular to the plane of incidence. By the way, the plane of incidence in this case is the your screen. That's the plane of incidence. So P is parallel, S is uh, perpendicular. So you can write this uh, Fresnel reflection coefficients in this fashion, right? Uh, so it also, you know, it sort of depends on this complex of index of refraction and the other medium that the light is coming from. Uh, and of course, it de uh, de also depends on the, um, um, uh, the index, the, the angle of incidence, right? So uh, let's say if you, uh, let's kind of, because I think nobody has a piece of paper because you're probably eating your sandwiches. So let's check quickly do this, the top of our heads. Uh, uh, because we don't have an envelope to calculate this. So let's say that I have a glass here, which has uh, K zero. It's just um, the real part is the, the N is 1.5. And if I basically send normal light, then actually this theta is zero because the angle of incidence is zero. So then N two is 1.5, N one is air. So that's 1.5 minus one. And then you have to add those two. So you have a 0.5 divided by 2.5. That's one fifth. And if I, uh, that's just the coefficient. And if I square that, I get 1 25th. And that's a 4%. So that means 4% of light will be reflected. So you can use these equations to calculate, just to calculate your reflection and transmission. So in glass, 4% will actually be reflected and 96% will be transmitted. So these are just kind of quick, uh, you can use these for uh, quick calculations. But so ellipsometry, what we do is basically, you take the ratio between the P polarized and the S polarized. And because these are complex numbers, now you get a complex number. And traditionally, we, without writing A plus IB or something like that, you write this as Z I theta, if you like, EI theta rather. So that means basically you have a, 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 a sort of a magnitude and then sort of the, the complex part is also taken from this, uh, is associated with this. So these, the psi and delta are what we measure in ellipsometry. So sort of the two variables. And so basically the bottom line is if I measure psi and delta, I get the ratio of these ones. And in the ratios, what you know is, of course, you know the angle of incidence, right? And then, of course, if you know the angle of incidence, uh, you can also calculate the transmission as well. But really, from the t psi and delta, you're trying to recover the complex index of refraction of this material. That's the basic idea. All right. So that's the physics of ellipsometry. Uh, and then now the only problem or one of the, the complications with ellipsometry is that you get uh, psi and delta values for each of the energy, and then you get a spectrum for psi and delta, uh, as it's shown in this, uh, this figure. Uh, but now this is called an inverse problem in physics. It's not like X-ray diffraction, where you see the Bragg peak and you know where the theta is, theta Bragg, and then you can figure out your lattice parameter. That's not uh, the way you can do this problem. You have to now sort of construct a model and uh, sort of see what, if, depending on the thickness of this and a kind of a rough layer, and uh, depending on the, the complex index of refraction of the film, you're trying to match the experimental data with your model data. And once you find a match, then you know that you can find your N and K and the D1 and the D2, which is the thicknesses of the 
rough layer in the film. So uh, that's why it's called an inverse problem. So what you want to do is to get spectra like psi and delta spectra using ellipsometry and then construct a model like this, right? So to construct a model, you need to know what your layer structure is, right? So if you have six different layers, you have to have six different layers on your model. And then you have to basically, um, uh, uh, what the bottom line is you want to try to walk away with the N and K values plus these, uh, the other variables are the thicknesses of your uh, layers. So that's the idea of modeling. And uh, so this is sort of, uh, uh, you have to have a little bit of experience to do this modeling because it, it takes, uh, uh, there's some, you can always find a solution that may be incorrect. So you got to, uh, once you look at uh, uh, hundreds and, you know, hundreds and thousands of these, then you can figure out, okay, uh, I think uh, I got the right one. So that takes a little bit of uh, experience, but more about that as we proceed. Okay, so now the molecular base, uh, the MBE system that uh, Maria has, uh, is growing uh, samples, uh, has a, a Wulam ellipsometer that's coupled and, you know, it's uh, the angle of incidence is about uh, 75 degrees and you the spectral range is uh, is this about 200 to about 1700 uh, but remember now you can't like exit you like the ellipsometers that are at Kenyan I can take uh, ellipsometry at different angles of incidence and sometimes you need multiple data sets to get a good model right but in this uh, it, when you're doing in situ then of course there's only one angle that you can do the experiment because your uh, everything is fixed to a, 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 a port and you, you can't change this angle. Uh, then of course, the, the other thing is you can do temperature dependence measurements because while you have grow the sample, let's say after you grow the sample, you can actually uh, ramp the temperature to different uh, values and you can take two uh, ellipsometry and then that way, you can actually do uh, try to get the dielectric function as a function of temperature, which is kind of uh, important, right? Okay, so just uh, most of the audience probably have worked with this uh, 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 topological insulators. So of course, the, this is a really cool material, and uh, uh, you find that uh, uh, you the, the the dispersion relationship. It's sort of a linear relationship and you have a Dirac point and all kinds of cool things, uh, 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 topological states that are kind of uh, uh, coupled with uh, spin and momentum. So uh, we uh, use these to kind of probe a lot of interesting physics, fundamental physics, and also to build devices. So uh, there are two, um, two uh, I, I said we were going to, uh, I was going to talk about two studies and in the first study, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, sort of uh, single films that is just uh, bismuth uh, selenide that are, that are grown on basically sapphire. And of course it has a cap layer, more about that later. And then the second study that I'm going to talk about is sort of heterostructures, complicated layer system. And uh, maybe uh, uh, you can ask Maria about all of these things. Uh, uh, well, and I can probably give you an idea why you grow such a complicated system. But basically all these structures are grown in order to sort of uh, obtain high quality topological insulators. And now we want to sort of talk about how we can use in situ ipsometry uh, to sort of optimize these kinds of uh, structures. Okay, uh, so let me just say in one say the, the going to first talk about study one. So these are the bismuth selenide single films, right, grown on sapphire, and there's a cap layer as well. So uh, for our study, we have used basically uh, five uh, different uh, 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 set of samples, five samples which are having different uh, uh, thicknesses to purple layers. Uh, basically, uh, this is nine and going on to uh, uh, higher layers. And uh, uh, so th th this is sort of the, uh, the thicknesses are different. And once they come out of the chamber, uh, we have performed uh, uh, XRR, X-ray reflectivity measurements. And then of course, by uh, 
sort of uh, uh, modeling the these uh, the fringes, you can now determine the thicknesses of the layers uh, uh, of these all the samples. So we can in this set of in this set, uh, as I said earlier on, you can take do ellipsometry and you can fit for the thickness as well as the dielectric function. Sometimes it's better to have the dielectric function or uh, a good value. You can sort of optimize it with your ellipsometry, but it's good to have a good value so that because these are sort of coupled, otherwise uh, you might get into a bit of a problem. Uh, so the, in this set of samples, we have the thicknesses from uh, X-ray reflectivity. So that's basically, and there's a read pattern as well uh, uh, that if you like, you can, uh, you know, uh, just to show that these are good films. All right, so now in this particular film, uh, uh, every single film, we have performed about eight measurements of uh, ellipsometry uh, as the sample is basically growing. So, so basically let's start this, this is the time axis. So we load the sample and then get it to the uh, growth temperature, 225. And now there's only the substrate sapphire. And then you take, uh, ellipsometry spectra of the sapphire substrate. All right, then you grow the bismuth selenide, right? And then you take another uh, SE2 spe spectroscopic ellipsometry second spectrum. And then after that, we heat it up to 250 and leave it there for about 10 minutes. And after that, take another spectrum, come back to 225, take another one, and then every 25 we reduce the temperature of the, the sample by 25 degrees. And at, after each of that reduction, we take another ellipsometry spectra. So this is a beautiful uh, uh, series to kind of observe. In fact, um, I'll, I'll talk about this more uh, when I talk about the heterostructures, but uh, one of the problems with ex situ ellipsometry is that uh, after you grow the sample and you take it out, you can have a lot of oxides and other uh, crap that's growing on your sample. And then if you do ex situ ellipsometry, you have to model that crap as well, which is not an easy thing. Modeling high quality samples, uh, so the layers is uh, hard by itself. And then to model this uh, 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 other kind of oxides and other layers is very difficult. And so you can sort of get sort of uh, uh, inaccurate or imprecise uh, dielectric uh, uh, functions because of that problem. So really doing in situ stuff avoids that uh, post growth problems. So this is then you can actually get the dielectric functions more precisely. So that's an important thing to think about. So, so all right, so we are now basically, uh, uh, I'll sort of try to go over this uh, SC1. That means uh, uh, how do we sort of uh, look at the ellipsometry spectra of the substrate, what information can you get? Then after that, you grow the layer, then how do you basically, uh, what's the information you get? And then also the temperature dependent stuff. All right, so now, Let's just proceed. Uh, okay, the first is the substrate. All right, so this is SC1, only the substrate. So you have measured the psi and the delta as a function of energy. So this is the uh, uh, this is in situ ellipsometry, the uh, ellipsometer that is coupled to the MBE chamber. And you can see that basically uh, the symbols are the experimental data. And now I have to sort of model the uh, ellipsometry data. So we basically, uh, 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 we have in in uh, in any ellipsometer there is a the, the software has a library of the optical constants of uh, various materials a lot of the substrates that you use so in this case sapphires uh, or dielectric function is well known and uh, you take that from the library and you model this and you fit this and you get a a pretty good fit and you might say that there's kind of some noise here but look at this scale is very small right this is just a fluctuation of about a half a degree uh, and uh, once we get this uh, match we know that uh, the substrate is uh, behaving well why, why, why do I say that well uh, sapphire is basically anisotropic 
and most of you grow this, use Sapphire and grow it on the seaplane. So then we know that if there is a kind of a small misalignment in the seaplane, you can catch that with this particular spectrum, right? So that means if you find, if I can't model it properly uh, with, with using a seaplane, then I know that probably the substrate is slitter. Also, um, uh, I'll just want to show you one other thing here. This is basically uh, a situation where uh, this is the this is the spectrum from the sample that uh, that was grown for this study. But this is another example of a, another sample where when you see the psi and the delta, you find that you cannot fit the the delta with a straight line like this. Okay. So by the way, let me just go back a little bit to give you an idea. Here you see that the delta is zero. Now the question is, why is the delta zero? And it's the delta is zero all over the, the, the spectral range. So let's get back to our ellipsometry equations because uh, this is an important thing to show. So uh, we have basically uh, the, this tan psi and uh, e, e, i delta. So now if I have a substrate that is completely transparent, like sapphire. It's not absorbing in the spectral range. Then you realize that K is zero of sapphire in the spectral range that I'm measuring. Then that means this, this is no longer a complex number. It's a real number. So the ratios of this is also a real number. That means this part is real, therefore delta has to be zero, okay? So this is why uh, if you don't have delta equals zero, like in this uh, left-hand spectrum, right? Then there's a small problem. So right now here, the delta is not zero. So this was taken off of a substrate of sapphire and uh, we analyzed this. And why isn't the delta zero here? Well, it turns out there is some thing that is deposited on the substrate even before you start growing something. Okay, all right. So look, these are complicated problems that you folks who are growing probably know why this might happen. But what I want to show you is that if you have in situ ellipsometry, you can observe this immediately, right? When the delta is not zero, you know, if you're just taking the ellipsometry spectra of a, uh, 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 just the, the transparent substrate, then there is something on it. So uh, then you might start growing things, but then this crap is going to be on this. So, uh, so this is sort of some, these are kind of immediate uh, feedback that you can ob uh, obtain if you have uh, uh, in-situ ellipsometry. All right, so that is an example of uh, some, some kind of benefits of in-situ ellipsometry. So now moving on, so now we've finished the substrate. So now we have grown the bismuth selenide and we take, uh, this is SC2. We now uh, get our psi and delta and I'm showing for two samples here, one with uh, nine um, QLs and then the other one with 87 QLs. Uh, so this is one QL is about one nanometer. So this is about nine nanometers and this is about, you know, 87 nanometers. Uh, so uh, you have the psi and delta. Now, uh, because I know the thickness of these films from X-ray reflectivity, I can fix that uh, the, for, on my model. I can fix that value and I can fit a model for the dielectric function of these two layers for bismuth cell. So these are technically, uh, if there is no sort of confinement effects or anything like that, technically I should get the same dielectric function for the bismuth selenite in both cases, if it's like bulk-like. Uh, so uh, the, the, the model lines are the solid lines. And now I'll show you, we have a good fit for the, uh, the experimental data. And then when we look at the, the dielectric function, here's the epsilon one, the real part. And here's the, on the right-hand side is the epsilon two, the imaginary part. And the blue and the red lines 
uh, basically correspond to the nine and the 87 respectively. And you can see that they are almost, uh, they are coincident. So basically we have, um, uh, we have good agreement with the dielectric functions and there is no sort of, uh, 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 you know, a lot of these uh, films have, if you try to draw very, let's say one or two layers, uh, uh, you might find that the dielectric functions actually change because of these confinement effects. Uh, you can see this in TMDs, for instance, uh, quite, uh, it's very conspicuous. Uh, but in this case, we have sort of gone above that limit and they are behaving uh, nearly like bulk, but there is kind of agreement with the, the dielectric function. So, so now this was one of the objectives. We wanted to kind of uh, use these films to measure the dielectric functions. So now the question is, uh, all right, what can we do with these dielectric functions? Well, okay, uh, we can further analyze the dielectric function with the oscillator model, right? So we can think about in this, uh, the, the dashed line is the imaginary part of the dielectric function. And you can write the imaginary part of the dielectric function as a collection of oscillators each of them representing some sort of a transition. It can be a kind of a absorption due to electrons or phonons, free electrons, as I said before. So uh, in this particular case, to model this dielectric function, uh, we have to use of about five oscillators, right? And I've given the, I've drawn the, uh, the, each of these oscillators in a different color. Right. So then then the question is now, you know, you might ask why five, why not seven? Well, uh, if you can fit, a, get a good chi squared value with five uh, and uh, 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 without having seven, then, you know, you don't want to overdo the that will be uh, too many oscillators. But then these are helpful to check uh, with DFT calculations. All right, so here I have uh, uh, some kind of a, a, a DFT calculation uh, from uh, something published in 2019. Um, and uh, if you uh, look at the, uh, the sort of the transitions, uh, so by the way, now, first thing to note is that these are all electronic transitions. Phonons are not around here. Phonons are milli electron volts. So here you are starting about 0.7 electron volts. So no phonons here, so all to do with electrons. Now the question is, how about the band gap? Is can I get the fundamental, the uh, fundamental band gap uh, oscillator to represent a fundamental band gap? Technically, I mean theoretically, yes. But the band gap of bismuth selenide is about 0.3 electron volts, so well below our spectral range. So we cannot uh, get the the band gap uh, that transition, the fundamental band gap, but these all correspond to high, um, um, high, um, high level electronic, um, uh, higher order electronic transitions. So for instance, if you look from the valence band one to the conduction band one, that's the 0.3 electron volt transition, which I can't see. But if you look at B, which is at the end point from the valence band B1 to C1, you can get, see that. Then other one like A, uh, uh, so, so another transition uh, would be basically from the valence band two to the conduction band one or conduction band two. So all of these transitions, so now this is, but I just wanted to give you a kind of a feel for the problem, right? There are a lot of details to worry about uh, and uh, I'm not an expert on DFT calculations. Uh, and you know, you can, so, so really the, the ellipsometry sort of measures sort of the joint density of states, if you like. So this is kind of by getting the dielectric functions and further analyzing the dielectric function, one sort of gets insights into the band structure. And then you can use that to either verify or refute DFT calculations. So this is an important uh, uh, function of ellipsometry. So uh, that's one, uh, one interesting thing. The other thing is the temperature dependence. Uh, and as I said, you, uh, told you earlier, we took measurements of this each sample at different temperatures from 250 to going down to uh, 100 Celsius. So we can then basically uh, look at 
how these each of these oscillators uh, change depending on the temperature. So this is plot is a little bit uh, complicating, but all these dashed lines show the dielectric, the imaginary part of the dielectric function, and the solid lines are the individual oscillators that I've used to sort of, uh, because these five oscillators are summed up to produce that, uh, the, this, this, uh, the dash curves. So you can do uh, 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 a lot of investigations of how these, be these transitions sort of change depending on the temperature and uh, get a lot of interesting information such as electron phonon coupling. So these are, uh, I, I, I'll just leave it like that, but just wanted to tell you that th that's kind of important uh, information that one can uh, get uh, uh, by sort of investigating this dielectric function further. Okay, but then what good is it for the grower? So right, we measure the dielectric functions. Now, what I can do is once I measure the dielectric function of bismuth selenide, uh, then I can basically look at psi and delta at say one electron volt or 1.5, you pick, doesn't matter, but then you can just simulate what should be psi and delta for different thicknesses. So this is five nanometers, 15, 25. So if I want to grow 25 nanometers of bismuth selenide, what do I do? Well, once I start the growth, I mean, ideally, you want to basically do ellipse, uh, in situ ellipsometry while it's growing, but that's not a good idea because your ports will all get uh, deposited with the material. So that's not possible, I think. Uh, but you can stop it, take a quick scan because the scans won't take uh, more than, it's probably about two to three minutes or only. And then you can, uh, by uh, uh, stopping when your psi and delta is exactly at this point, then you know that you've got 25 uh, nanometers of bismuth selenide. So uh, you can now, uh, so, you know, the, so, so, so sometimes these don't have unique values, right? So, you know, uh, you don't know whether if you have this value, whether it's, you know, um, 20 or whether it's close to 90, but so so you that's why you need to generate these curves at different values. So so for instance, here it's sort of overlaps so almost right. So there's so by doing these curves at different energies, you can find the the most kind of the uh, the the curve that is kind of most um, um, very different. So therefore, you can use that to sort of. Uh, uh, control the thickness of your growth. So this is uh, one of the benefits uh, for growth. Okay, and then, um, all right, so I think I'm going to, uh, yeah, I'm going to say one other thing. You can also use this, uh, um, uh, use feedback from ellipsometry to sort of uh, 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 explore issues like desorption, right? So now one of the things that we noticed is that Let's take a look at this uh, picture again. So if you start with this SC2, which was taken at 225, and you take it to 250, and you come back to SC4, which is at 225 again, you should sort of uh, see the same psi and delta because you know they are at the same temperature. Okay, now you can see that the delta is approximately the same, but the psi is vastly different between you know, this sample, which what you have just done is to basically take it to 250 and bring it down to 225. So this tells us that probably some, a little bit of film of bismuth selenide is sort of maybe evaporating. And that's what we are seeing why that is basically, um, there's a difference. So uh, basically we can investigate this also through another way, if you, uh, if you basically look at the temperature dependence uh, dielectric functions that I have obtained for each of those, um, using each of those spectra obtained by ellipsometry, you can get the dielectric functions. So this is a confusing graph, but I just wanted to look at um, the epsilon two. One of the things that you'll notice is that this 225, this black line here 
is when I started the, uh, when I, once I deposited bismuth selenide, this is the, uh, the dielectric function that I got. Then when I take it to 250, you can see that this is at the bottom of this, right? And then the, when I bring it back to 225, there's a huge difference between this black line and this green line. So technically, these should be the same. If I take the, measure the dielectric function of bismuth selenide at 225, I should get, be getting the same uh, epsilon one and epsilon two. So that this, so when I try to model it like this, thinking that the thickness is the same, uh, I get into these issues that saying that I, there's a kind of a problem because the, 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 the dielectric functions cannot be different. So the only resolution, so this is also to show uh, a better view of this, that is to show that the before and after the dielectric functions are different if I assume that the thickness has not changed. And of course, that is a bad assumption. Thickness has clearly changed. So when I now model it, uh, when I do uh, sort of uh, take this spectra, the 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 225 before uh, spectra, so both of these spectra are what I obtained uh, at after I drew the bismuth selenide, and I uh, at 225, that's the spectrum. And if I basically use nine nanometers uh, and uh, model it with the dielectric, the correct dielectric function, it does not match. But then if I use the correct dielectric function, the original thickness increases by about seven angstroms. So what has happened in this film is that when I grew it at 225 uh, bismuth selenide, I actually grew 9.7 nanometers of it. Then when I took it to 250 and left it for 10 minutes, about 0.7 nanometers dissolved. It basically evaporated uh, because when I well, what I measure from X-ray reflectivity finally is the thickness that I end up with, which is nine nanometers. So, so this is also kind of interesting uh, information that you can get with ellipsometry, in situ ellipsometry. Okay, so uh, once uh, uh, I just want to now move to my second, um, the heterostructure. Uh, okay, so the basic idea now I've showed you, you can get a lot of information about uh, single films. So now we'll talk about this uh, heterostructures. So here in this case, why you grow here, once again, what you want to try to produce the high quality topological insulators and uh, you grow this in this fashion, uh, mainly because you can actually, if you grow bismuth selenide in this, uh, on, on top of these uh, buffers, you have basically uh, low carrier densities and high mobilities and pretty good quality uh, topological surface states. So this is the reason why you do this. Uh, and of course, growers, uh, Maria would be able to explain this better. But now the question to uh, us is that, how do we basically use, uh, when you're growing such a system, and if you take, uh, if you have the luxury of in-situ ellipsometry, and you take ellipsometry at after each growth cycle, or after each layer, then how can you use that to kind of get information? So uh, before I go to tell you about how, what information we can take, I want to also say that now, just suppose that this structure was grown and it was sent to Kenyan and I was asked to do ellipsometry, we were asked to do ellipsometry, I can only take one spectrum and with one ellipsometry spectrum, I need to try to get information about all these five layers, the indices of refract, the, the dielectric functions plus the thicknesses. So that is a difficult problem. So with multi-layer uh, heterostructures, exudu ellipsometry is a very difficult thing to do. Uh, so when you are growing structures like that, if you have the, uh, you, if you, you can do in situ ellipsometry, that becomes very advantageous because then you can actually sort of get layer by layer information, the dielectric function and the thicknesses 
using this uh, this technique. So uh, this is just a quick uh, outline of this. We have used four samples in this study. All right, starting with a kind of a single layer of bismuth selenide, and then of course, then uh, you grow alloys as well as uh, this is the main structure that we want to concentrate on. So to grow this final bismuth selenide, you have to sort of, you know, tease it into with other layers and then finally deposit this on bismuth indium selenide. So uh, these samples are useful for us because this allows us to kind of get the, uh, each of measure the, the, the dielectric function of say indium selenide, <clears throat> which we want to use for this one. So we can build the, uh, our library of the dielectric functions of all these different layers uh, using these four samples. And then uh, here we show X-ray as well as AFM and read to show that you know, we have high quality samples. So let's go to the ellipsometry. So <clears throat> as was done in the earlier study, you put the sapphire into the chamber, you get it to the growth temperature and you take an ellipsometry spectra. So this is the uh, this is the sapphire, and then we basically can fit this and uh, 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 get uh, find out something about the substrate, and then we grow bismuth selenide, and then you get once you finish the bismuth selenide, you get a psi and a delta. That's this in A spectrum. So here we show we have had bismuth selenide, and then of course now we can basically model this and get the thickness and the dielectric function of bismuth selenide. Then we can carry on. After we grow the indium selenide, we take another spectrum. And of course, now the psi and delta, they have changed. And then we can model that and get uh, the thickness and the, the dielectric function of this. And then we just keep going. And of course, in this step, what we are doing here is the, in, uh, the sample is basically heated from 300 to 600, you annihilate. it. This is an important step. Uh, and then once you annihilate, it, uh, and then you basically bring it back to 225 and deposit your bismuth indium selenide. And then of course, after that, you deposit the bismuth selenide and finally a cap layer, all right? So this is a complicated uh, structure, but uh, what I want to show you is that we have basically fitted all of these spectra carefully. And now we can basically uh, obtain the dielectric functions of each layer uh, through this mechanism. So basically this is bismuth selenide, the lower one. And then uh, the, this is the indium selenide. I plotted the bismuth selenide here just to kind of give you an idea that think how things are changing, right? So uh, this is the dash line is the bismuth selenide. And then this is the indium selenide, the solid lines. And then you can see here, this is the indium selenide uh, at uh, the grown at say uh, the, uh, the the deposited and the anil one. So there's a difference here too in the dielectric functions. So you can get information like this, and then moving on, you can basically uh, and uh, finally end up with the selenium, the cap layers dielectric function. So so now uh, by uh, doing this systematically, you can actually go uh, layer by layer, uh, the dielectric functions. Uh, and these are pretty precise because as I said, if I got this X situ, it's very difficult to uh, do this sample. So there's one thing I can uh, quickly share with you before I finish up is that uh, one of the things that we notice is that let's take this sample and then here um, um, I show the growth step. So yeah, we basically after depositing bismuth selenide, you can basically see there is bismuth selenide, right? Then after that, uh, we deposit basically indium selenide at 300 uh, Celsius. And then we heat the indium selenide, right? What happens now? So these are basically thickness on the, the vertical axis. Uh, I don't see any green here, right? So what's the story here? The bismuth selenide has gone for a walk. There's no more bismuth selenide once you uh, anneal the 
uh, sample at 600 C. And that is what we see in all of these samples. It's there once you put the indium selenide, and then uh, after that, uh, it basically uh, uh, so this is about you know uh, about six to seven nanometers of bismuth selenide, and you can see that it just sort of evaporates uh, after you uh, annul this the, the sample. All right, I think um, yeah, okay. Just one other slide uh, before I finish up is basically to show that uh, I can now uh, analyze the the bismuth selenide that is drawn on. Uh, via the heterostructure structure and the bismuth selenide that is grown on a single uh, on 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 sapphire and with careful analysis i we could show that all of the oscillators width is a slightly smaller for bismuth selenide that is grown on the heterostructure, structure which means that you have a better quality bismuth selenide when it's grown on a heterostructure. structure so that's this analysis all right, so I'm going to finish off because I think uh, I've got five more minutes. So right, so basically I've uh, shown that you can use in situ ellipsometry to um, uh, 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 when, when you are growing single bismuth selenide films, you can de determine the dielectric functions very carefully, uh, precisely, and then of course use that to sort of um, get uh, uh, get calibrations on how to grow uh, the correct thicknesses for future growth, as well as uh, uh, basically overlayers, uh, uh, these kinds of things. Uh, uh, and then of course, the, the other important thing is that we, with in-situ ellipsometry, you don't need to sort of model these additional surface layers, which becomes a problem when you're doing ex situ. So once we find the dielectric functions, we can sort of compare it and sort of either white validate or refute DFT calculations. Uh, and then also the temperature dependent dielectric functions can be used to kind of get more information about electron phonon coupling. And more importantly then for the for growth folks, you can use these dielectric functions uh, to basically then uh, monitor the ellipsometry parameters during growth to get uh, thicknesses and uh, you know to sort of predict desorption effects. These kinds of things will be uh, you can do with in, in situ ellipsometry. Uh, and then of course, when growing heterostructures, it, it becomes kind of very important to do in situ ellipsometry because then you can have information uh, layer by layer. All right, I think uh, I'm done. Yes.